Uh, good morning to our speaker for today, Inche Arizu Penang. To everyone here who has joined us, uh, welcome. I'm Lawrence Kong. It's, it is my pleasure to be a moderator for this session today. Uh, first, allow me to briefly introduce to you the intent of the um, webinar today. This webinar is a part of webinar series focusing on Malaysia global competitiveness ranking in how we as a country manage the totality of our com competencies to increase prosperity. The global competitiveness ranking is evaluated and reported every year by international organizations. One of these organizations is IMD. IMD is a private business education school in Switzerland, uh, short for International Institute for Management Development. Uh, it is not a university, uh, but it publishes uh, this performance in their World Competitiveness Yearbook every year since 1989. The yearbook benchmarks the performance of 63 countries based on 255 criteria measuring different dimensions of competitiveness. It uses two types of data to compare countries. Two thirds of the data is hard, what we call statistical data, uh, which they collected from international and national sources. And one third of the data is survey data, or what they call the executive opinion survey, uh, which they collected again from different uh, industries in different uh, countries. Uh, in the recent uh, World Competitiveness Yearbook 2020, uh, Malaysia's competitiveness ranking has dropped five positions since last year uh, to 27th this year in 2020. So imagine this, we are ranked 27 out of 63 countries. This rank of 27 is the lowest for Malaysia in the past five years. Uh, there are four categories of competitiveness factors uh, these countries have been compared. Uh, the factors are economic performance, government efficiency, business efficiency, and infrastructure. Uh, today, we are honored to have Inche Ari uh, Zukanain sharing this topic with us on rule of law. Rule of law is a criterion in uh, the um, factor called government efficiency. And within this factor, a sub-factor called uh, in institutional framework um, measuring the um, state efficiency. Yeah. So this is about uh, our government power and the civil justice efficiency. Inche Ari will be sharing with us uh, the highlights and issues of our current IMD ranking of rule of law. He will recommend improvement plans to help Malaysia increase our future ranking. Now, before I transfer the audio to him, let me first introduce Inche Ari. Inche Ari is a trainee associate in the corporate and uh, government advisory practice group uh, at Zaid Ibrahim and Co. Uh, this company is a member of Zico Law. Uh, Zico Law, in case you don't know, is a network of um, leading independent law, law firms focusing on ASEAN countries. Uh, they have a large uh, quantity of uh, uh, able lawyers uh, working with large enterprises and SMEs in both public and private sectors. Now, Incha Ari is currently involved in advising of federal government including various ministries, agencies, statutory bodies, particularly on law reform areas, um, like area in reducing regulatory burdens and area in deregulation. He also has background in communications uh, based on his previous work experience. With that, uh, let me now hand over to Inche Ari. Inche Ari, over to you now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lawrence, and uh, thank you for that introduction uh, just now. Uh, I would like to say uh, welcome to everybody who's also on this uh, webinar here this morning. Uh, I think the, the topic here today about uh, the rule of law is a very important one. It's a topic that uh, affects everybody uh, sometime or rather in their life, whether directly or indirectly. And I just also want to thank MPC for uh, having such a, a uh, focus uh, idea about how do we put this particular sector on, on the rule of law. I know it comes on, a, on, a, on the government efficiency uh, platform under the 
IMD and the World Competitive uh, Yearbook, uh, which um, looks into uh, various countries and how it, it sets about its uh, economic, social uh, aspects to figure out the ranking process. Uh, this is a very big topic, actually, uh, as uh, Ms. Lawrence just said, because it covers a wide range of uh, factors. So what I'll do, I'll move on to the slide uh, content so that everybody can see. Uh, part one, I'll define on the rule of law and the understanding Malaysia's current ranking, uh, where we are today, uh, understand measurements uh, and a process, and factors and issues that we will look into. Uh, part two of it, I will look into the uh, key authorities and regulators. And uh, part three, uh, we'll go into identifying policy and regula regulation changes required for rank improvement. And uh, step four is the recommendations that actually we, we should consider uh, in order for us to ranking. And uh, the last part, part five, is our next step and conclusion. Uh, the step one is, of course, defining the rule of law. But uh, before I go and uh, talk about defining the rule of law uh, and why it matters and, and where we are, it's important to note that uh, any recommendations here today, uh, I must qualify this point actually, it's just for us to consider. I know uh, people will be, be asking, is this a set recommendation? I think I'll qualify it. Today. This is just something that uh, policymakers or the public at large should just consider because there's an issue on, on timing, there's an issue on suitability uh, and political will as well that comes into place. But I'll just get it up front where all these are just uh, some, some food for thought for us to, to consider rather than take it as set in stone. So let me start by actually defining what is the rule of law. And the United Nations uh, definition of the rule of law is the principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, uh, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly uh, promulgated, equally enforced. Uh, that's the key word, actually, and independently adjudicated, uh, which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. So, as you can see by the definition itself, it, it shows that uh, the application of, of the law is equal to all uh, and it requires measures to ensure adherence to the principle of supremacy of law which i'll go into a bit uh, later on about malaysia's uh, federal constitution uh, equality before the law accountability to the law fairness in the application of the law and the separation of powers uh, participation in decision making where the public has a say as well the legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency. These are all uh, how the United Nations defines the, the rule of law. And another aspect that I think uh, the Mr. Lawrence, I think, would want to know, and a member of the audience, is why it matters. Uh, it's effective. Rule of law reduces uh, corruption, it combats poverty and diseases, and people, and it, it fights injustices, and so on and so forth. So it really matters to everybody. Uh, like I said, it has an impact either directly or indirectly uh, to people. So that's why this is a topic, I think, uh, it's, a, it's a big topic, which I will try to uh, break it down later on uh, so that it's easier for, for us to digest and understand. Uh, but furthermore, I think the, the effort here by MPC to, to go about this uh, rule of law, it's not just about trying improvement. I think that's the, the, the subsequent effect of it. But if we actually do make some uh, adjustments to it, I think the country as a whole can benefit uh, somewhat uh, into to this uh, overall uh, movement towards uh, improving the rule of law in the country one way or the, uh, the other. So if you go into Malaysia's uh, current perspective, uh, well, right now we are still in the index, we, are, we have seen some improvement in our Malaysian rule of law index. Uh, as, as the report will focus on an initial as, uh, assessment on which eight indicators that need improvement, I will break down the eight factors later. Uh, the report will also look where Malaysia is currently um, ranked right now. And I'll explain a bit later on about where we are and why it's important. Uh, 
so if you look at the recap on the WCY, which is the World Competitive Yearbook, uh, where Malaysia is, we have improved actually from 2016. Uh, in 2016, we were at rank number 38. So right now we are ranked 31st. So there has been um, some improvement. Of course, uh, we can talk about that later on. And But the rank improvement is actually due to certain reforms and initiatives that have been carried out uh, by the government. And it's an ongoing process, which I feel uh, it's, it's slow, but it's steady. Uh, there's, there's more things that, that needs to, to, to happen. We go to the, the next slide. Um, okay, so as you can see, uh, Malaysia is currently ranked 47 position in the rule of law. Uh, what we use WJP here, uh, for, let me just clarify, is because uh, the WCY takes into consideration the, the factors given by the WJP, which is the World Justice Project. And the World Justice Project is a more focused approach in determining ranking of uh, particularly in the area of the rule of law. So it has uh, almost 128 countries that it, it uh, reviews and it gives uh, it, its rankings based on the factors that I will explain later on. Uh, and Malaysia is currently ranked 47 position uh, in that ranking. It's actually an improvement of four positions uh, from 2019, 51st place, which, which actually is, is a good improvement, uh, although it's just four spots, but it's a steady improvement. Um, and one more thing that I must highlight early on is that in Malaysia, the, when you talk about the rule of law, uh, the federal constitution is a supreme law. We have um, the constitution here, which unlike the United Kingdom, for example, uh, which is not written, but in Malaysia, we clearly have a codified uh, constitution, which uh, it actually uh, spells out how the rule of each uh, institution from the highest uh, rulers to, to the uh, the citizens, you know, their rights, their responsibilities to which, and it clearly lays out. So it wouldn't be uh, complete if I don't talk about the federal constitution or at least highlight the importance of the federal constitution in, in talking about the, the rule of law. But let, let me just go back to the areas of, of factors here, Mr. Lawrence, about uh, where we have probably um, needed to improve or where we have gone below the region. Let me just explain what is factor one, three, four, six, eight, here, which I will go into a bit uh, detail later on. Uh, here we have uh, from the ASEAN region or the, from Asia, there are some factors where we rank probably below um, the average, uh, like constraint on government powers, uh, matters of factor three, which is open government, factor four, which is the fundamental rights. Uh, which is the right to privacy, factor six, which is the regulatory enforcement, and factor eight, which is criminal justice. So these are probably areas in which Malaysia probably needs some improvement, which I will go into a bit uh, detail later on when I break down the, the factors. So as you can see from the slides here, where we are in our overall score, our regional rank, we're seven out of 15. Um, and these are just an indicator of where we are. And when we say we're number 47, we're just uh, below uh, Argentina. And of course, South Africa there is number 45, and Dominica is number 46. So I think we can do better in, in this uh, area, but of course, it takes uh, slow but steady, but progress to, to make the right happen. Now, uh, let me just go through about the top 10 uh, best countries that we have for 2020 when you talk about the rule of law. Uh, as you can see, the, the top four countries are dominated by the Scandinavian countries or Scandinavian-based countries. Uh, and this is probably due to a number of factors which uh, probably could be known to, to, to many watching here today, but they have a very strong sense of uh, community. And of course, their population also is much smaller uh, than, than us, but this is just to highlight uh, the top 10 uh, best countries. Uh, but also to highlight that there are no uh, ASEAN countries in the top 10. Uh, Singapore, you know, is just ranked outside the top 10 at number 11. Um, while we have countries like uh, South Korea, Japan, and Hong Kong. Of course, Hong Kong uh, is a special place uh, which made it to the top 20. Uh, if you look at the bottom 20 uh, places, well, 
it is dominated mainly by countries from uh, Africa, Central Asia, and South America. Uh, and Cambodia, being a member of ASEAN, which is ranked 127, which is second last place, and Venezuela actually is ranked last. Now, Venezuela, interestingly, is, is a country very rich in natural resources, uh, has one of the biggest oil reserves in the world, but still, when it comes to ranking their rule of law, uh, they are ranked bottom by, by the WJP. So it goes to show that sometimes it's not just about how much uh, reserves or assets you have, it's about the willpower to actually enforce uh, the rule of law that matters. I will just go to the next slide. Uh, if you look at the, the top countries, which uh, Denmark has consistently ranked number one uh, for a number of years, uh, and this is due to, to a number of factors. If I can just explain uh, why, what Denmark is, is getting right, you know, it has, I think, for the last three or four years, it, is, it has been consistently uh, ranked top, you know, and there's a lot of issues going on there. Mind you that the population of Denmark is also just around 5.5 million. You know, it's a very big uh, land mass uh, country, but the population is uh, relatively small. And, you know, might, a lot of people might not know this. It's actually population-wise might be smaller than, than Singapore at 6 million, but one thing about Denmark uh, from the, the research that we've done about Denmark is that the community there is very close. It has a big uh, trust factor amongst each other. I mean, this is just based on research that we've done. Uh, there's a concept, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, called Hegi. You know, it's about uh, values and community plays a very strong part there. And uh, I think besides just government enforcement in Denmark, I think the public also is very vigilant about what goes on in their community. Uh, so it, it goes on a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, basis where the enforcement of the authorities and, and, and the public as a whole are very aware of things. And issues, uh, moral issues such as uh, ethics is, is very much part uh, probably in school and also in, in, in the place. Um, and of course, acts of, that, that has an impact on, on shunning away acts of uh, corruption uh, and so forth. So adherence to the rule of law is very much uh, community-based, you know, and, and that is something, uh, even if we want to emulate uh, in, in Malaysia, we must understand how we do it because it's all easy and good just to say that this is a, definitely a model Malaysia has to follow. Yes, it is a model that Malaysia can try to emulate, but how suitable it is uh, for us to actually follow must be also studied because we just don't want to have a one size fits all and we say that's the answer. But then again, there's some things we can we can learn um, from, from Denmark, which should be highlighted. The second country that I want to uh, highlight here is Singapore. Uh, I think, like I mentioned earlier, Singapore uh, has been consistently ranked in uh, ASEAN, especially as a top ranking country for the rule of law, uh, although, you know, may say one thing or the other, but I think for, for Singapore, they have a very good enforcement uh, strategy or policy in the country. So that has a lot to do with how uh, the factors, which I will explain later, plays an impact on, on how they, they can manage uh, to ensure that uh, when we say application of the law or enforcement or feeling secure uh, is very highly ranked. Of course, it's a smaller nation, it's an island nation, but why we pull Singapore out here? Because they probably have uh, similar traits to us in terms of the breakdown of demographics of the country. Uh, and then and it's our neighbor as well. So we kind of know them as well. Uh, but they, they also, the, the, the government has a very central role in making sure they really, uh, you know, the, their authorities there, they have a, I would say a, a strong arm to the public when it comes to law enforcement. So that is something that maybe uh, we can consider to emulate or learn from. I'm, although they are our neighbors and we have a history in them, but some things that they probably do uh, right, you know, it's, it's worthwhile for us to, to consider to, to take on. But mind you, they have a smaller uh, land space, so that probably works uh, in their factor as well. So. What I'm trying to do in these two countries is just to, to highlight the, the importance of the rule of law uh, that they have 
factor that makes them so highly ranked. But another factor I think which uh, must be highlighted about these two countries is that uh, economic wise as well, they are doing quite well. You know, uh, of course, I mean, uh, of course this COVID has an impact on everybody as well, but in terms of the yeah, social uh, inequality of income, these two countries have been very, uh, you know, it's very close uh, between the, the highest ranked and the lowest income in society. So there's a uh, income equality is very low there. So it has a correlation if you study the first 10 countries on my previous slides. All these countries also have an improvement in their economic uh, well being that has an impact on the rule of law. So when we talk about the rule of law, uh, when we emulate these models, it's not just about the enforcement or the community. I think how the economy is managed as well in the, in the, the long term or in the policy wise has an impact on how the rule of law is um, uh, catered up to everybody. Mind you, this is a very big topic. Uh, and of course, uh, as somebody who's working in the law firm, I think this is the most important topic out of all the, the MPC topics with due respect to everything else. But let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is just uh, an example of where we are because this is a four week uh, uh, overall study that we've done and we presented each one to, to MPC. So this is where we are uh, at this report. So I'll just move on to the next. So everybody just wants to see. Okay, um, this, this part is the, to understand the measurement process and data information and source factors. Uh, like I said, we had uh, for so WJP, the World Justice Project, was broken down into eight factors, actually, because if we talk about the rule of law, it's, it's very wide, it's very big. So uh, for, for if you look specifically for rank improvement, what they did was they broke it down into a number of factors so that it would be easier for us to make recommendations, understand the topics, and of course, um, how do we actually come up with some recommendations as well, it must be broken down into this. So if you look at this, uh, the first topic would be constraint on government powers. Uh, it's, a, it's a very sensitive uh, topic here, but we'll just put it down, you know, to the extent to which the, uh, those who govern are bound by the law. Uh, it comprises the means and both constitutional, like I said, Malaysia, we have a, a written constitution, thanks boss. Uh, an institution by which the powers of the government and its officials and agents, which is the, the civil service, are, are limited and held accountable to. Uh, and the, absent, the second part is the absence of uh, corruption. Uh, this is, an, I think, a big issue uh, around the region, actually, uh, not just in Malaysia, but I think we've made some efforts in this. Of course, there's a lot more that uh, we can do, but I think efforts have been done. And of course, the issue on uh, open government, this is something to do with also um, how much access does the, the public get or the citizens get into doing um, government uh, policy or understanding certain things that's been decided by the government, how much it has been shared. So uh, this also is a factor in which uh, we, we look into uh, to see maybe there's some recommendations that can happen uh, going forward. Um, and obviously, the constitution also has the right of certain citizens set in place. But we look, if you look at the sub factors here, it's uh, how the laws are known and government data is shared with the public, uh, the right to information that we have, uh, civic participation. I think this is another important um, issue and complaints mechanism, how public can raise um, an opinion as well. And the fourth, uh, factor here is the fundamental rights, which is the positive laws uh, that you know, respect the core of human rights uh, of, of uh, the public. And the sub factors here are equal treatment and absence of discrimination, uh, right to life, well, you know, right to life and security uh, of persons uh, is effectively guaranteed. Um, a new process of laws and rights, uh, I'm just going what's written here, the freedom of opinion, and expression is guaranteed, so you don't fear uh, persecution or repercussion after, and uh, freedom of belief, uh, assembly, uh, privacy, and labor rights. Uh, if you look at the, the next four uh, factors, the number one is order and uh, security, which is, uh, it looks into how well a society assures the security of 
uh, persons and property. Uh, security is one of the defining aspects uh, in the rule of law. Um, what we mean by security is, is if you look at the sub factors, is the crime is effectively controlled. Uh, civic conflict is limited, but people do not resort to, to violence. Here, if you look at the first part on uh, crime is effectively controlled, uh, it's easy just to point to the fact that it's the authorities that have to play a key role here. If you look at the police, uh, the immigration, or, or the, the MACC, for example. Uh, but I think the public also has, has a key role to making sure that uh, whatever is happening by the authorities or crime, it's not just a one-way street by the, the authorities. I think we don't uh, emphasize enough how the public has uh, to play a key part here. Like we said, um, what happened in, in Denmark as well, I think a key feature there, I think you know, if some people in the audience would know better and explain to me as well, that they would, that the community has a strong uh, presence in, in deterring uh, crime. So it's not just always a one-way street, although it's easy just to say we need to get 50,000 more police or whatever, but uh, ensuring that the community plays a part in ensuring order and security is also a key factor. Uh, I'll move on to the sixth factor, which is the regulatory enforcement, um, which is the extent to which regulations are fairly uh, effectively implemented and, and enforced. Uh, this has to do with, if you look at the sub factors, um, how it is applied and enforced without proper or without improper influence. Uh, proceedings are conducted without delay and government do not interfere without lawful cause. So this is basically how uh, enforcement is, is done without, you know, big brother or, or heavy hand in issues. I don't know how Singapore got number 11, but yeah, there we go. Uh, so civil justice, if you look at it, uh, whether ordinary people can resolve their grievances peacefully uh, and effectively through the civil justice system. Uh, I think this has a lot to do with uh, our, if you look at the sub factors about how people can access and afford uh, civil justice. Uh, and then this is when you go into the, the just, justice system, you are free of uh, discrimination, uh, free of corruption or undue influence of uh, improper government influence, no unreasonable delay, um, and then alternative dispute resolutions as, as one uh, recommendation as well that we will explain later on. So this is uh, this factor number seven here. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people who are watching would have more knowledge than I do about the importance of, uh, of this. And if you look at the factor number eight, which is the criminal justice um, Factor here. I mean, this is easily uh, the factor that shines uh, the most when you talk about the rule of law because this affects someone's uh, liberty, you know, their right to, to, to live. Or, you know, if we do have a death penalty issue, for example, this has a factor in them. And, you know, if they are punishable by jail or whatever, this has an impact on them. So, uh, factor number eight is something that I think we. we discuss maybe slightly on in terms of our recommendations. Um, basically, it's, it's how the, the delivery of the criminal justice uh, should take into consideration the entire system, which is uh, not just the, the courts, but also how the police handles um, the, the people who are detained, uh, the lawyers, the, the, uh, the deputy prosecutor, and the judges, and of course, the prison officers as well. So all these are factors when you look into the criminal justice uh, factor. And um, the sub factors are how is investigation done effectively, adjudication system is, is timely. That is also uh, a factor. Of course, if you delay someone in remand, that has an impact on them and their overall well-being. And that could be justice as well, uh, you know, delayed against them. Our correctional system is effective. Of course, there will be unfortunate incident of the, the COVID cases in the jail, but I guess that was uh, something that needs to be improved on. Uh, the system is impartial, it's free from corruption, no government influence, and the right of the accused. I think that's, that's a key element there, the right on the right of the accused. So if we look into this system or these eight factors, which I just mentioned, uh, which WJP has nicely broken down, uh, this gives us the, the idea uh, on, on how Malaysia can uh, improve uh, on our overall ranking. 
um, let me let me qualify and, and also say that the objective here, although it's it's um, improvement in ranking, but I think our bigger duty here is to make sure that the country moves forward in a more uh, cohesive and, and in better way. So if this results also in rank improvement, uh, very good. But if we adopt some of this, I think the country can benefit uh, as a whole. I'll move on to the next part of my talk, uh, which is the, the another key part here is we need to identify. Uh, so it's all good that we identify the factors, uh, but we also need to know, I think, um, on who can actually be the primary mover for such a policy. Uh, for us, because we 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 know that the authorities play a key role here. So what we've done, we've actually broken down. Uh, like I said, this is just uh, initial uh, research. So you know, everybody watching, relax. You know. So uh, th this is um, we think our key stakeholders to to influence some of the recommendations and some of the changes uh, probably needed, which is number one. Uh, the Prime Minister's Department, the uh, Bahagian um, they are a very important uh, body which actually also introduces some legislation to, to Parliament and they become the thinker or the introducer of certain bills, correct me if I'm wrong, members of the uh, audience. Uh, another one is the, the Parliament of Malaysia, of course that's the, the body that scrutinizes the executive um, you know, we have uh, backbenchers and also members of the opposition. So parliament is basically, um, uh, parliament's key role is to to give a check and balance uh, as well uh, to, to the uh, members of the executive. So they are a key stakeholder here. And the other part is, of course, the judiciary, um, which is a very important part. Um, some of the recommendations also We'll touch upon that, but I won't go into too much uh, detail um, on that just, just yet. Uh, of course, the AGC as well uh, looks into um, drafting certain legislation as well, and also how uh, prosecution is done in this country. So they have a key part actually in improving the overall um, applicability of, of the law and also how the law is uh, done overall in this country. They are a very key uh, stakeholder. Was the Bar Council of Malaysia, you know, another key uh, stakeholder here. And if you look at, at the suggestions that are also written down here, the, the possibly input that they can play in the Bar Council gives a lot of a lot of insight into how our legislation should be uh, amended or their opinion on it. And of course, why we put uh, SSM here, because the rule of law, uh, like what I said earlier, it's not just about the court system or authorities, I think everybody somehow the, uh, or rather is impacted directly or indirectly by the, the rule of law. And here, even when you look at public listed companies as well, the how it's applied actually, uh, this is the, when you look at the rule of law, it's about even before you go to court, even how people respect uh, the regulations, uh, you know, on, on compliance on issues. So. It's all in all a factor taken into consideration as well when we look into the rule of law. And something that I've learned uh, where, where I'm working right now is the importance of compliance and all that. It, it all uh, matters when it comes to the rule of law. And if you look at the other stakeholders, um, I think as many people know, of course, the MACC plays a, is a key part in uh, fighting corruption in, in this country. They are one of the key bodies here which um, I guess uh, has been responsible for uh, improving the overall uh, fight against corruption. Although it's a lot to do, but uh, let me just share their latest uh, amendment, which is under 70 as well on corporate liability. And well, that has um, I, you know given an impact as well. So I think they've, they've done a lot here, and they are a key stakeholder into uh, fighting uh, corruption in this country. Which, it should be enhanced. And of course, the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, KDN, uh, they are in charge of the police, uh, which are PDRM, another key uh, authority to ensure the security of this country. The prison system, again, has the impact on the criminal justice system of this country. And the Immigration Department, which is overall to do with uh, protecting our borders, which we will 
go into uh, which I will go into a bit later at the recommendation part. So Kenya definitely has a has a key role here. And um, why we put the Ministry of Higher Education as well, I think the role of the academia and and um, we should not be undermined here. I think you know the more writings they they give, the more opinions they write out, and uh, it definitely plays a part into how we can be the rule of law because it's all good to think that the government can just give an input, but when we have uh, people of influence from the academia field, they can do a proper study, they can give us an opinion about how things are moving and probably they can also base on suitability of certain policy. So their views uh, definitely should be uh, put at the forefront of how we actually improve the overall uh, rule of law in this country. Uh, of course, Bank Megara uh, is another important regulator here. Uh, of course, there's uh, SC as well. But when you talk about Bank Megara and NSC is, is how they, uh, Bank Negara specifically uh, looking into AMLA matters. So this is something uh, cross-border um, uh, money laundering and terrorism. I know Malaysia has some issues there which uh, Penagara and uh, the regulators are looking to improve. So possibly standing, uh, strengthening the financial regulations and services provided uh, it, it is key for Penagara to, to, to be put at the forefront here. And we're just highlighting all this because these are the key movers and shakers uh, that's needed to, to actually help our country improve in the ranking. Before I go to the second point, I just want to highlight the Ministry of Defence as well. Uh, they play a, a key fundamental role in our national defense and protecting our border security uh, together with the, the KDN. So uh, those two actually should go hand in hand, which we'll explain uh, later on. And I uh, think most importantly is, is private associations and the public. This has to be, uh, again, emphasized and uh, the role that society plays in improving the rule of law. Uh, you know, I mean, we can have the best legislations, uh, you know, designed but uh, or, or drafted, but if the public is not uh, willing to participate or willing to keep those who are, you know, of, of authority on their toes to ensure enforcement continues, I think that's when, um, you know, the rule of law is just something on a piece of paper but not enforced. So the role that society plays in, in ensuring enforcement ensuring that the country as a whole moves to, towards that direction, I think should be uh, highlighted. Uh, if I can move on to the next one, which is the, uh, these are just an example of what we need when we look at the, this is before the recommendations, when, when we look into uh, who, what kind of uh, initiatives there are and what kind of uh, agencies involved, if you look on the constraint of government powers, these are just some examples. Uh, maybe we should consider a select, uh, parliament select committee, you know, to increase it even more. And, and maybe those helming it should, should be from members opposite, not, not the government. Uh, and this gives a direct uh, check and balance from a parliament perspective. Uh, the next one is the absence of corruption. Uh, but let me just highlight the, the possible agencies involved, which is parliament and BHEUU. Uh, and then absence of corruption, which is separate uh, procurement committee, which we'll highlight later on in the recommendation part. Uh, you know, and then parliament probably to enhance even more anti-corruption measures. 70 a was a clear highlight and the use of IT. Uh, I think if we, we, one thing that we, we should highlight is uh, the less human interaction there are. This is a very general statement, I know. And uh, the more usage of uh, IT or, or more, I want to say less, we lessen the human meeting and just more of looking at a, a tender, for example, purely on merits and having an audit committee that's uh, blind on who is the one giving it by looking at the, the company's strength itself uh, with the help of IT should be enhanced. Uh, of course, it's something that the MACC and the BHEUU, uh, you know, that's the government as a whole can look into. If you look at the other factors, um, uh, issues on open government. Uh, this is something that we possibly could look into the Freedom of Information Act uh, in Malaysia to give um, public some access, uh, increased participation from the 
the public to make um, you know their, their views on, on matters public participation i know this is a very uh, big issue that is currently happening but we have to possibly work on a mechanism so that you know the, the idea of uh, government knows best uh, it's not always at the forefront, you know, and a, and a bottom up approach can be implemented when it comes to policy wise. Uh, this is something that I think my firm, uh, uh, my department has actually been at the forefront with, with the regulatory impact assessment. Uh, this is something that's, um, I think, should be done. Uh, it gives the, the policy makers an idea or understanding before they introduce something uh, that the uh, RIA actually about. What would be the, the impact that would happen when you introduce something? So this is something I think should be be done in a, in a wider range. Uh, you can call my firm for that. Uh, and then the uh, fundamental rights. Um, how Swakam plays a role um, in this, which we'll highlight later on. And the ministries uh, involved: Parliament, AGUU, the Bar Council. Um, also, society plays a key role in in always voicing their their issues. Uh, particularly in this matter, because when society and the public raises their concern and raises their issues, I think that's when things really, really move. So I cannot, uh, you know, emphasize this uh, enough. We go on to the next one, which is the order and security, uh, improve the, the overall welfare of the agencies. Um, because we're always looking uh, in terms of high, you know, enforcement, enforcement, yes, but we also should this at this point also consider that those who are doing the enforcement are also human beings. So maybe if we improve their welfare, uh, hopefully it would have um, an impact as well. So this is something that we should just look into. Uh, enhance community policing. Um, this is another factor which I, I, I believe is important. Uh, localizing the police so that the community in itself knows the sergeant or inspector within the community so that they're both accountable to each other and they understand the local community. And this is again, community plays a key role. Uh, the sixth factor is the regulatory enforcement. Again, similar to the first point uh, about the parliament select committee. Uh, and then maybe setting up, we had a KPI, maybe making the KPIs uh, public as well, would be something that the government should consider and, and, and then do. If you look at the civil justice, um, these are just some factors. And of course, the, the bar council will play a key role here, and the, the courts also would play a key role. And the last factor, I think, is the um, criminal justice system. Uh, you know, we need to have an oversight of the enforcement agencies. I don't want to go into detail about the, the, the IP, you know, independent police uh, misconduct uh, commission. So we'll save that for some other time. but. These are just uh, um, some of the agencies involved if we were to do some sort of improvement uh, in this. And I think what I'll do next is I'll go to the recommendation part before I think any questions there are from the members of the public. So as you can see, there were eight um, factors in which we, we highlighted that, that uh, the WJP used. Actually, so out of these eight factors, we came up with a few recommendations each. And uh, let me qualify again why these recommendations are just based on uh, thought provoking. They are not set in stone. They're just something that can be improved on. Uh, if there's any comments as well, I uh, would love to hear it. But these are just some sort of um, thought provoking um, ideas that policymakers or the public at large uh, can just consider. So I will start with the first one. Uh, it's, it's on the constraint on government powers. Um, of course, as you can see, the issue is here. There's concern of big government oversight, uh, how ministries are held accountable. And uh, like we said uh, previously, uh, parliament should be one of the best avenues to, to control. Um, when I say control, have a check and balance mechanism here. So enhance to include uh, parliament select committees um, and maybe include uh, qualified personnel to assist MPs uh, to understand issues. This is something that's already been done. We have uh, particular select committees. Uh, again, the recommendation here is to maybe have uh, more qualified personnel involved. Maybe there's some technical issues uh, that needs enhancement. So making or having a qualified uh, individual to be 
part of that committee would help maybe give a uh, scrutinize the measures and give an understanding as well to our very clever members of parliament. And then the uh, other issue is the concern about, um, of course, this is a big issue. Uh, then again, I qualify this to just some sort of idea. So relax, members of the audience, about you know having an uh, anti-hopping law. Uh, again, why this should be considered probably is one certainty. I think uh, the public, the investors, uh, and I think the civil service as well, for the sake of the country, probably want some sort of certainty. So these are just some recommendation measures. Uh, of course, I'm open to hear other issues um, or other suggestions, recommendations. These are just some of it, maybe an anti-hopping law, making sure the tenure is more set. But uh, again, these are just some top line recommendations. Um, and then maybe one of the uh, issues as well, um, the appointment process of the judges. Uh, this again uh, is, is always continuous issue about how we can make the judiciary more uh, independent, you know, and uh, because this is something uh, even the United States, uh, for example, uh, if I can just share, was just uh, trying to confirm a, a Supreme Court judge, uh, the lady by the name of Judge Barrett. So even the president has a say, but uh, the Senate will then confirm or you know, so each country would have a different mechanism. So we always have to look into how do we improve our selection process of the judiciary by making it more independent. And I'm open to, to hear uh, comments, uh, if any, later on. But these are just some of our recommendations, the factor number one. So if you look at the factor number two, which is the absence of uh, corruption, again, the MACC plays a very uh, strong role here. Uh, and they have done, uh, I think the government has also introduced a few measures. But what I'll do, I'll, I'll talk about, uh, members can, and so long as you can read the issues here, I'll talk about the proposed recommendation so that at least we have a quicker um, oversight on, on this, which is maybe have a, always have a separate procurement committee. I know that there are already uh, happening, but maybe we need to, to enhance that, that part of separate procurement committee which cannot be uh, overridden by a higher authority, you know, because their, their, their decision has to be purely based on the merits of, of um, companies involved. And of course, we talked about including uh, IT as a key part of uh, procurement. So I think this is something that we should really invest in um, when we talk about the absence of corruption, because it's all so easy to say we'll, ca we'll catch this, we'll catch that, and all that, which is very good. But then it comes post what has been done. So this this measurement uh, here or this recommendation comes uh, pre to to what can be done. So that we always uh, before the act happens, it's, it's always a, a good measure to to have in place already. And then uh, I think the legislation should also try to rotate uh, people in key positions. Um, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, there's, there's a case involved in one of the local councils where the, the, the uh, enforcement, hit, you know, was, was caught as well. So maybe considering a rotational basis every two years so that you don't get so familiar with the local area is something that we should consider. I know, you know, we just mentioned about police having uh, an idea about the localizing, but Maybe on certain things we, we should consider uh, continuous rotation so that you know they don't get too familiar with certain places um, to avoid un unduly uh, things happening. And of course, um, you know, establishing the, the public service act, because right now there, there has been a, a policy actually to so that uh, ministers are asked to declare their assets, but I think senior officials. Although it's not done publicly, maybe uh, we should consider uh, publicly um, declaring their assets as well as a measure. And of course, uh, I think MPC is involved in the Jawatan Kwasa Khas Cabinet, Magna uh, E.A.T. Raswal, which is a JKKMAR, um, which is actually one of the key issues which uh, I've uh, learned from um, is that a lot of the, the, the tender or the procurement methods are Actually, they're they're not very well. They're not very transparent on their guidelines. 
So therefore, people are unsure how to do it and you know, making it very clear about how the procurement process works. Uh, I think it's something that MPC has um, pushed uh, a lot, I think which is a very good initiative, I must say, is to make it more uh, transparent. And I think this is very good because most of the time people really want to participate, just don't know how to. Therefore, you know, that's when the unnecessary calling, unnecessary uh, asking happens. So if you can avoid that by making it very clear and having clear guidelines, I think that's how you, you actually work on, on this. Uh, the next factor, which is, um, again, open government. Um, of course, Freedom of the Information Act is something that uh, we should consider uh, happening. Um, there is a balance here also between what is freedom of information and the OSA, the Official Secrets Act, here uh, for, for, for many of you might not know. Um, it is actually the balancing should be done by courts, you know, and it's always easy to say the Freedom of Information Act should happen, but um, there must be suitability uh, of, of time uh, and political will to make this happen. And like I said, these are just proposed recommendations. I don't want to start a World War III debate on, on, on this just yet. Um, and then the next policy recommendation is, of course, RIA, um, where every policy, I think it's already a, a KSN circular, but it should probably be something really, really done. I call my firm for that. And uh, of course, compulsory public consultation process. Uh, this should be done. Uh, I think the public also want an idea about how policies are, are done or implemented. And this gives the government I guess a better long-term uh, understanding because if it's just a top-down approach, probably public acceptance of, of things might not be so good, but if it's something that uh, bottom up and top-down where they can meet in the middle where public has a feedback as well, I think that's how we have a weak situation. And I think this is when uh, legislations uh, can be more adhered to because the ones who are drafting it and the ones that are actually gonna be impacted by it to the public, can actually uh, understand how this the spirit of such legislation is made and how it should be implemented. We go to the next uh, factor, which is the fundamental rights. Uh, then again, I'll just talk about the recommendations. Um, and this is something that will always be in the need for improvement, uh, which amends act to provide further details on the grounds, because some people when they're in remand, you know, um, or police custody of seven days or whatever, they should be given a uh, due process on their reasoning and uh, without undue delay. So that is something uh, we must make it very clear. I know there's, there's a whole lot of uh, legislation already involved in that, but make sure that people who are detained get a, a clear reasoning why and access to, to a lawyer would be uh, key here. And, um, Another issue that, that's always happening in Malaysia or is the peaceful assembly or the right to, to do so, you know, uh, because before I think the position was very aggressive towards any sort of assembly. And then uh, over the years, I think authorities have been uh, having a more softer approach towards how they accept people to, to uh, protest peacefully or assemble. So having a clear SOP, um, I mean, before COVID, yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? It is, is, is important uh, about how you can do it, maybe, you know, how you send permits as well, the time length. These are all already being dis uh, discussed, but having a more uh, certain way to do it so that at least uh, people's right to assembly is not uh, diminished, but then the consideration by the authorities for security also is met. So having sort of a, a, so a clear, clear guideline here and, and known to public, it's not, you know, it's, it's no point being clear guideline only to the authorities, but public cannot access it. I think having it accessible to the public and discussed with the public uh, is also very important. And of course, the, the role of Suhakam here, which is under the PM department, uh, maybe should put it, make it more independent, possibly under parliament. Again, this is just a suggestion. Uh, with its own budget and policy definition can help. Um, and then the, the possibly strengthening of the Sexual Harassment Act. 
uh, within the employment, uh, sorry, sexual harassment punishment within the Employment Act should be strengthened as well. That's a first step measure, yeah. Uh, next one is the order and um, security. Uh, this is something where it's increasing here, where there's also um, address issue of digital sex crime. As you know, this is something new and something that we need to address. Of course, as we hear the news of uh, what's written there, hidden camera, you know, voyeurism. Um, so really looking into this and having a clear understanding of, of maybe it should not just be, you know, a silo cases. I think there's a lot of cases that, that's happening here. Of course, I need more data to, to understand this issue, but I think we need to have stronger legislation, particularly in the digital sex crime uh, department. And of course, the sexual offenders registry. I think we're not probably there yet, but we need to consider this because it is a serious issue. I think a lot of countries maybe some western countries have already taken uh, this matter seriously i think we should too as well to look into this matter uh, another part which i think we should consider is the border force unit um, as you know this means uh, we had before the national blue ocean strategy which is uh, where different departments and ministry work together uh, this is something we should consider uh, border force unit i think a few countries if I'm not mistaken, uh, Australia or New Zealand has already done such a thing where you know we've taken the, the immigration, the customs, and the police, and also uh, members of the military as well to be part of. Uh, uh, it's not a single unit; we don't dismantle it, but they work more uh, along the lines of, of one thinking, so that they don't work in silos. Uh, I think the upside here is, is possibly where intelligence can be shared, uh, information can be uh, really to real time and i think this, this is key here because border security i think goes beyond just stopping people from coming in i think there's bioterrorism there's other threats involved as well even cyber security and if i may share i mean in the last uh, few months we've seen water shortage as well i mean although this is not uh, strictly a border force uh, issue but this is something where all the authorities uh, particularly enforcement can work together because it shows that uh, having a lack of uh, this enforcement can put the capital into ransom, you know, by just cutting off a uh, key water supply, you know, and, and uh, I think this is something having a more shared intelligence can uh, help to deter these sort of uh, issues, which, which I hope uh, your public, uh, the authorities and policymakers will consider. Uh, the next one is the regulatory enforcement. Uh, maybe again setting up KPIs and making it public. Uh, the second part is the, um, of, obviously we're trying to push for more independent judiciary about how judges are elected, how their remuneration are granted so that they're not bound by, by you know, any favors or anything or on new influence. So they're very, very independent. I look forward to, I don't have the answers uh, for that as a whole, but I'm sure a lot of people by listening and out there can give you some recommendations already have given thank you very much uh and maybe uh i get th this is another issue that uh, the country has been uh recently talking about which is the setting up an independent uh, independent conduct commission uh maybe for the police for the macc there's pros and cons here which uh, a lot of people watching has been um talking about maybe we do need a separate commission to look at their complaints and misconduct. But then again, um, takes a lot of understanding. I think it's not just about, if we just implement it straight away, that's when it's just a top-down approach. I think getting stakeholders involved and making uh, the particular authorities uh, understand, maybe the police, MECC, where this thing is not to prosecute them, this is poss possibly to help them. Uh, and I think this is when you get everybody involved in making it a reality if you really want to do a, a commission. Um, next would be the civil justice. Uh, again, uh, this is our thinking is, uh, you know, people need to know their rights. Possibly having, uh, teaching them 
some basic idea about their rights from uh, secondary school, you know, so that they know what they, they can do, uh, making sure that the second part is, you know, because the court system, although it has improved, I, I don't want to go into detail about how long the court process takes. Uh, I'm also trying to learn about that. So maybe having an ADR, which is the alternative dispute resolution as part of a clause of the contract, maybe it's quicker, maybe uh, the court is already very quick, but thinking about other ways rather than just uh, delaying your justice or, or your, your court, um, figuring out ways will, will be a beneficiary and, and a way very beneficial actually. So we need to figure out, uh, create more ways to, for this to happen. And of course, um, we had the KPI for, for court appearance. So the court also has a number of uh, time where they have to settle the case. So this is probably can be reviewed and improved. Uh, and maybe case management. So before cases actually go to court, I think some of my other colleagues who are involved in litigation would know best um, on, on how case management can be. And I look forward to suggestions there. And I think the last part is the criminal justice system, uh, where we should come up with the recommendations on, we hear uh, death in custody, which I think should not happen anymore in Malaysia. So one of the ways is, is um, you should put more CCTV um, lockups. And when it's not working, you know, we should probably uh, you know, the police uh, station question, um, you know, answerable to that, you know, if something were to happen. Uh, and last part, I think, is um, possibly reviewing the death penalty um, in Malaysia, because as of uh, the information given by Amnesty um, National about Malaysia is that we have already had around 469 people executed since 1957. So that's a lot of cases uh, of people happening, and they're mainly on the 39B, which is the Dangerous Drugs Act, uh, which is an issue which I think we could really uh, consider. But then again, I don't want to get a World War III discussion about that. These are just some recommendations that I feel uh, should be considered by those in power. and. Um, the public at large should also be able to discuss about these uh, matters. Uh, I think that's all for the eight recommendations, uh, Mr. Lawrence. I think for the, the conclusion, um, as you can see, is you know we took the 25 recommendations was based on eight factors. Um, if I may just say uh, a few qualifiers again, these are just top line uh, recommendations, and maybe it's something that we can consider. Uh, as a takeaway is the possibly anti hopping law, how we're going to enforce that, uh, the border force, uh, increased use of IT, of technology procurement, and to ensure a rotation system in key public service positions so that you don't get too familiar and you know something unduly could, could happen. I think with, with that, uh, my, my presentation is is, is done on the rule of law and what I presented to APC earlier last month. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to possibly any comments or any um, you know suggestions from, from you, Mr. Lawrence, and from a uh, few hundred who are watching here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That was uh, very enlightening. Uh, I think we don't get this kind of topic sharing uh, all the time. Like you right. said, this is uh, not just about ranking. Um, you know, after listening through the uh, presentation, it's not just about uh, competitiveness uh, between countries, but it's covering a bigger overarching issues that we should be looking at. Like you say, it concerns every one of us. Um, there's no questions yet from the audience, but I think they are probably immersed in what you said. Yeah, yeah, we take it that way. I think this is yeah. the time to uh, let the audience to start to uh, think about uh, comments or uh, questions. It's open for questioning. So those who have uh, questions, please do type in uh, your questions so we can we can then uh, address it over here. Um, maybe while waiting for the um, audience to um, 
you know, post questions, we can probably um, discuss a bit about uh, the content of what you presented. Um, it is, this is big, this is like eight factors within the uh, World uh, Justice Project. Uh, like mm -hmm. you said, that uh, IMD is already taken to include in our WCY in mm -hmm. 2020. Since it's so big, um, and it is about our justice system, it's about our legislation, about our law, um, you know, typically one would think about using data. Like you said, you know, we need data to, um, to compare these things. Uh, it's not about public opinion. So it's interesting, um, just trying to get an opinion. It's interesting that um, even the, uh, the JP or the DCY, uh, they would uh, rely on survey. They rely on um, getting household survey on this kind of um, right. uh, status from what the government is doing, what our laws are uh, 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 right. enforcing. More than 100,000 household survey. So it's like, you know, we are not getting Hard data. I mean, this hard data should be available in our justice system and in our in our law. Uh, how our government enforces it. So, what is your opinion um, by getting um, survey data to um, determine how well we do instead of getting hard data like evidence, hard evidence to try to compare the governments what they're doing. What is your opinion on that? I I, I think uh, when it comes to the rule of law here. Uh, you're right. I mean, hard data is basically what's what's given by probably the, the authorities. But uh, when it comes to survey or soft data, here comes from the perception that the public in general gets, you know, from what's happening. Um, the rule of law is, uh, to me, and I can answer first, is is a very much a um, perception issue, right? Because Legislation written in, in a lot of countries, uh, even in Malaysia, are very good. You know, the, the, the drafting of it is, is is very good. But of course, the issues of enforcement, although it's always an improving uh, evolution, you know, still needs, uh, because it, it's when human comes in, right? So that's when it, it's lost into translation. But the, the key of improving this and, and why public perception is important, because uh, the law is one thing. How you implement it, that really affects the public. So that's when um, the public, uh, because it's not static, you know, when it comes to legislation or rule of law, or, I mean, even the factors we talk about, it's, uh, it's not static, it's, it's very dynamic. So the public has a, a, a say or as a fee, because as we mentioned early on, that some some point in your life, or even, even every day, you might not know, will be impacted by the rule of law, right? Mm. So every day, I mean, and and if I, can, if I may say, it's not always a, a positive experience, right? Because you deal with it every day. So sometimes when you feel justice has been served to you, sometimes you feel uh, there is no justice, or sometimes you feel that's how we should be anyway, even though it's so good, right? Mm. So the public perception towards, uh, rule of law is definitely changing. And, and like I said, the, the, the legislations are very well written, very good, but how it is implemented, that's when you know whether it is truly felt by the community, by the public. So that's why, you know, service uh, is very, very small, but people also might not know all their rights, you know, and that comes mm -hmm. into how do we say uh, maybe education about it, you know, and uh, starting from, we, we suggested probably having some rights from uh, secondary school, just some basic rights so that you understand. And and I think the idea of having basic rights in school is not to challenge the authority or it's not to diminish uh, certain authorities. No, I think it's to educate the public so that maybe a, a better informed public actually can help um, you know, policymakers can help authorities so that it's not a, a juxtaposition of opposing sides. It's actually, how do we complement each other to making sure society is safer, you know, the court system works better, people who uh, know their rights, you know. So 
I think the whole mentality shouldn't be when we say survey why it's it's down or up. It's it's probably how involved the community is. But sometimes um, you're also under informed or not, not misinformed or ill informed. You you're not so sure about all your rights. That's when you get little iffy here and there. You see, so that's why you you have to be very uh, informed in this matter. And the public and the authorities shouldn't look and to it as an opposing side. It should be like, how do we work together to make sure the system uh, works best so that you know when people have a perception of, of certain things, they understand it more than just face value. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I agree with you. I think um, when you talk about uh, your recommendations to even include public in the decision of passing certain uh, policy um, or legislation, um, using the bottom-up approach, uh, not just the top-down approach, so we can meet somewhere in the middle and harmonize uh, the opinions of the public. Um, hopefully, yeah. um, when the public is uh, aware that their voices matter in deciding, you know, how our law enforcement is working, um, yeah, I think this awareness is going to get better um, instead of um, just relying on hard data, I suppose. Yeah, yeah I think, I, I think the, the the impact of community here, I think, is uh, if you look, for example, when we chose uh, or you rank Denmark as number one, mm. right? Um, mm. The community plays a key role because the authorities every day they are going through something, but mm. it makes the the job easier for everybody if community as well plays a factor rather than they just question, you know, what are they doing? What are they doing? But if the community has a more structured role to play. In terms of enforcement, in terms of um, even community uh, community policing, for example, right? So mm. um, that that in itself, maybe strengthening the residents' association, you know, uh, formalizing that that grouping, you know, so that you know mm. if there's um, people who shouldn't be there, who are there, and making them closer to, to the police. I mean, those basic levels count uh, a lot in the long run. So, mm. like I said, the, the idea shouldn't be an opposing side between authorities and, and public. It should be mm. of how do we always uh, complement each other. And uh, it goes mm. more than just uh, rank improvement here. Of course, rank improvement is a bonus, but it goes mm. to how do we make the country um, a safer place, you know, uh, to put it simply. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I think this is interesting. You um, talk about the um, opposing force um, that we should uh, deter from. Um, I yeah. heard something like this uh, when I went to Singapore. Um, they say, if you want to learn more about what the government is doing, how the society um, law enforcement is working, um, let's talk to the taxi driver. <laughs> because on the yeah. ground, people feel, yeah. that people feel um, how the enforcement works, and people feel the effect of what has been pushing down from the legislation. So, um, right. yeah, like you said, I think um, asking the opinion of the member at large um, has its own credibility because we are surveying people who are actually feeling the effect of the laws. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah like, it's, like you, like you uh, contrast Denmark and Singapore, uh, Singapore, uh, who is our neighbor, yeah. um, the perception is actually working for them. You know, when I talk yeah. about people who uh, come to Singapore to invest, um, what are their top reasons coming to Singapore? Uh, why not Malaysia? Some of the top reasons they share are like, for example, oh, this country is safe. You know, you can walk yeah. around at night, uh, not having to worry about uh, being mugged or, um, um, you know, the yeah. crime, crime stats uh, happening. So this kind of law enforcement, it gives the impression not only to the general residents in the country, but uh, like you said, when when people compare between countries, it attracts investment. It attracts foreign opportunities uh, to the to the country. So, you're right, Mr. Lawrence. That, that's why uh, when 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 my my firm when we embarked this uh, rule of law uh, topic, mm. we mm. knew that actually, obviously, I'm being biased. You know, I come from a law firm, so we think it's the most important, but. But actually, it is the most important because the rule of law covers everything, you know. 
and mm. it covers uh, perception of how investments or investors would perceive a country even right mm. like a uh, simple thing as that they, they perceive singapore as so much safer than uh, other asean countries you know but mm. maybe malaysia is just uh, hopefully just as safe but uh, maybe the perception that we have it, it isn't so this is when again like like we mentioned just now that um you know when community gets more involved in uh, being part of the solution so it's not mm. just leaving it up to the police so that they become mm. part of the solution as well rather than you know or it's just the job of the police this is a job of the immigration authorities no so mm. i think as you bring the public more involved in in um, in this type of uh, community action or enforcement you will get mm. a bit more on on your side of course this is just um you know it's good to to say this but how practical is it to be done i think takes baby steps you know uh, and mm. i think policies should should be done in a way that uh, introduces um associations to the the local uh, police you know, I, I, i'm sure some resident associations for example already have uh, an open day with the, the police but th this should mm. be uh, encouraged there should be a, a model where you can do it emulate everywhere from KL, from Perlis, from Sabah, and all the small communities so that, um, you know, everybody knows their local police guy, you know, their local, mm -hmm. local police uh, uh, inspector, whatever, so that there's a sense of community here, you know, mm -hmm. that, that if something goes wrong, I, I know uh, so and so and so, they can come uh, and affect it. And I think the police, uh, if I may say, will be more than uh, welcoming uh, in, in this factor, but it's just breaking down uh, those barriers, it's just breaking down mm. those mindsets, and it, that mm. takes some effort, not just from the police side, I think from the community side as well, how they gather together and they think about how do we actually meet the, the police uh, or, or enforcement authorities in a, you know, in, a, in a way that we can work together in the long run. Right, so it doesn't mm. just have to be one open day. It has to be a continued dialogue, for example. And I'm sure it's mm. been done in a few communities in Malaysia, a few RAs. But having some sort of model where we can repeat uh, around the country, then mm. we can see, you know, even the taxi drivers or the Uber drivers are, are part of the solution. You know, when they see, oh, crime is low, but we've already detected, you know, this this one. So we we know, you know, mm. we can call our local police. We can call the authorities or you know they can come straight mm. away that builds the trust but then again mm. uh, what needs to be done i think looking further is some sort of model which we can, can emulate easily throughout the country mm. Mm. yeah you're right i think the awareness has to be raised otherwise uh, the perception won't get better <laughs> yeah sometimes true, we true. don't feel the effect directly but we feel the effect of the others so we yeah. may give the opinion because of what we see over here. You're right. Yeah. There are uh, a couple of questions I see now uh, posted by um, first uh, Mr. Mama Isaha. Um, hopefully this is not a World War Three uh, discussion. <laughs> Let me read out a question to you. Uh, yeah, sure. On factor two, on factor two, abuse okay. of corruption. Yeah. Um, the question. Uh, let me read first. Uh, it is imperative to look at this from all levels of government, like federal states, local authority. Consideration also needs to be given to the autonomy of three different levels. So, um, Mama Izaha thinks that there should be autonomy given, three different levels. Uh, having said this, and in addition to rotation, of enforcement agents. I think this tied to what you uh, rec recommended just now about the, the rotation to have um, more transparency uh, and autonomy. What are your thoughts on reviving local government election as another recommendation to consider? Okay, this is tying to our current real issue right now. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was asked by uh, Mr. Isha, is it? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, well, I'm sure he's a very stellar kind of guy. He looks kind of good looking as well. But I don't know how he looks like. But anyway. Um, okay, I'm sure he does look very well. Yeah. <laughs> Just a question I'm here. Sure, yeah. <laughs> he looking, 
Uh, I think the the uh, local elections is something that we've done uh, before. In, in if I can just give an opinion here. Right? Mm, then again, yes. I'm not trying to start World War Three. But uh, uh, no, it's a disclaimer. So don't worry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, maybe there are considerations that we need to look into as well. Uh, although it's good, maybe it keeps uh, people more accountable because every so often they have to answer to the community that, that you know they, they elected them in. Um, my, my thoughts on local election is that uh, if it improves uh, transparency and accountability, I think we should consider yeah uh, but if it just uh, causes more uh, politics to be put to the local council, for example, you know, mm. it, it actually hinders things from happening uh, mm. because, you know, you just have too much political consideration. Uh, mm. That, to me, that's the fear there because you already have uh, from a state level, for example, I mean, not, not those uh, in KL, but you already have the members of parliament, which is federal, and then the local uh, adon, which is the, the state assembly. Mm. Um, if the local elections produces more accountability, uh, then definitely you, you you will have. But my my fear is um, if you just have it just becomes another avenue for rewarding uh, people in the political process. So you know, typically in a political party, you have X number of members, so they'll just put their candidate there, and they might win because. They have a stronger support, not because of mm. anything else, but that that could also lead to. You're right. Um, I'm sure the fine gentleman by the name of Muhammad Isa also probably would think so. You know that it, it could give uh, more uh, accountability or transparency into how decisions are made. But uh, if it leads to more politicking, to me, uh, that's mm. my 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 fear because as it is already, you know. We have a lot of uh, politicking happening, unnecessary ones, but um, I don't know. I don't know how would we separate the the local authorities from, you know, it, could it be a hindrance from them not doing anything, for example, because, you know, they just so worried about election, you know, uh, or could it be that yes, that's the answer. But uh, I think for, to find a, a solution probably. Um, maybe we can test some of it uh, on, on not not maybe a whole uh, countrywide um, uh, run at once. Maybe one or two states uh, who's willing to to give it a go should should be to see how it works. You know, maybe does it improve participation? Does it call for more accountability, or does it act as a polarization? Because we, mm. uh, you know, I mean, to, just to, to be mindful of the reasons why it was pulled back uh, the last time as mm. well, so that should not be ignored as well. But having said that, moving forward, maybe we can try. Um, hopefully, with society being more mature, well, you know, uh, we can see if it if it uh, can happen. But maybe on a on a state per state basis, you know, and states that feel they are ready to do it can do it and then probably can judge whether it's a good idea or not because everything should be done in, in, a, in a in a measure that that's more controlled so that it works better in in the long term i, I hope i answer the, the stellar gentleman's uh, very fine question <laughs> you know i I agree with you. I don't I think there's a, there's a definite right or wrong answer for now i think yeah. that's why i think uh, this gentleman is trying to get your opinion um okay. Everything goes back to the top, you know. If uh, we're going to break it down by state and try, still people report back to uh, the federal. So yeah, I, I think it's not an issue that we can easily uh, give an answer to today. So don't worry if uh, yeah, because I I think mm -hmm. uh, like like we we mentioned earlier the the, the three three tier system in in the country, mm. um, because. There, there have been instances where the federal government is controlled by a particular party and the state is by another party. And if mm. the local council is held by another party, for example, um, mm. obviously 
the idea should always be what works best for the public, you know, but mm. um, hopefully if there's a mechanism that can say that, you know, having three tiers of, of elections is, is better, uh, mm. then by all means it should go through. But if it acts as a, as a too much politicking or hindrance towards um, decision making, I think that's when, uh, you know, we should uh, review it. But then again, it should be by, um, you know, a state should do it first, for example, if, you know, if this is really considered. And then if it works in that, uh, state, then I think other states should should consider to emulate if that is the overall direction that is. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure this is not a new topic. I'm sure this topic must have been happen happening inside some war yeah. rooms somewhere that we do not know of. <laughs> yeah. Let me yeah. read you um, another question uh, from uh, Mama Aizuddin, uh, Nor Asman. Uh, okay. The question is about the indicator rule of law. Uh, is asking whether this indicator include uh, the performance management or oh, sorry performance measurement on other platforms does this indicator include uh, performance measurement from on other platforms besides parliament uh, for governments to make decisions uh, some government decisions may come from majlis jama'a menteri or majlis tindakan ekonomi so does this include um, other performance measurement uh, on other platforms uh when we okay thank you for, the, for that question uh, i think when when we talk about for if i'm referring to to this particular factors here uh, and what we meant by the parliamentary select committees is because um when they go to the parliament right each ministry will be queried on a particular decision made right so for example yeah. if the cabinet makes a decision so it's still the, the best avenue to scrutinize, but it's the most orderly uh, way to scrutinize a particular decision. And mm. having, um, I think just to, if, if I may uh, take a dig at the answer is to, uh, if we have a proposed select committee, which looks into a particular issue, for example, maybe the issue is on we have a uh, select committee on education in Malaysia, for example, and there was an education mm. done, policy done in a ministerial level. So mm. the select committee made up of a few uh, members of parliament and like we mentioned, probably an expert mm. in the field, uh, mm. will all on the minister uh, directly. Uh, mm. Maybe it doesn't have to be in a parliament sitting, it can be mm. within parliament as well. If, if you look at how uh, the US or UK does it, uh, if I may just share, you know, it's not during parliament, it's actually um, they have a call and it's shown on public where they will be sitting down and the panel will be querying the minister on, on the particular mm. matter. So that's very transparent. Uh, yeah, so that's another avenue besides uh, when parliament is on. So having this, this uh, ongoing uh, parliamentary committee can uh, help and, and uh, parts of it can be broadcast live so that that particular minister you know is accounted to his decision not just during when parliament is sitting but the committee can call on the minister and um, you know uh, ask him to clarify certain recommendations made or policy decisions made so i, I get that and, and that has been done i think in in um, other countries as well uh, i recommend you know it's, it's should be done here and that's probably mm. another way in which uh, not just parliament during sitting but the select committee can uh, mm. hold those in in uh, authority to um, accountable for their decisions i but see I take this point, right. uh, i'm looking into other measures as well oh so so right now the answer is it doesn't include other performance measurement yet uh so now is your recommendation to put it in yeah, well, it looks into others as well, but we we when we put the recommendations, it's how do we actually get it to the most practical way for policymakers to actually consider it, you see? Because there are yes. other ways in which we can call it, but we have to put in recommend, I mean, there are hundreds of recommendations and I take his point as well. You know, there, there yeah. are hundreds of recommendations, but we probably have to, uh, take a few which if decision makers want to elaborate and want to understand more, 
maybe mm. you can uh, hopefully elaborate it more. You know, because there's, there's a lot of other ways, but looking at the practicality of how we actually do it, this is possibly mm. one of the most practical uh, measures to do it at this current time. But I, I do, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open for any other suggestions that maybe we did not think of as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, yeah. All right, um, there's a lot of uh, areas that uh, you covered. Um, maybe we are getting close to the end of the session. Um, oh. Just to wrap this up. Um, well, probably we can um, try to um, see what you think about the implementation. Uh, there are certainly a lot of uh, stakeholders um, in the list of regulators uh, who should own this uh, improvement because it covers a lot of areas uh, like what you have yeah. just uh, shown us. Um, so how, how, how should we go about implementing? What agency do you think uh, should be taking up the lead to perhaps um, harmonize all the ministries together, parliaments, uh, departments, federal departments together to implement this? This is a huge task. <laughs> Uh, well, um, you're right. It, it is a huge task, you know, to to implement uh, everything that we've discussed, and even the suggestions given by uh, members of the online audience. Uh, mm. Obviously, it, it, the, the typical answer would be the, the Prime Minister's Department, uh, which is okay. the bahagian hal ewal undang undang, the uh, key role. Uh, why I generalize uh, to say the Prime Minister's Department because they would probably have the influence as well to call upon the other ministries and the other agencies involved. You know, mm. uh, they would also have the influence to gather, um, I mean, the, the Prime Minister Department, you know, mm. have the, the, the cloud to call in the, the uh, Home Ministry, the Defence Ministry, um, and to discuss about this with the uh, AG's chambers as well, because mm. uh, it's a very typical answer, you know, if, if you want to know that's the, the body that can call on everybody to make a decision because it probably has, a, with all due respect, probably a higher ranking uh, basis to call everybody in, you know. Mm. Uh, but then again, uh, that's just part of the equation when you talk about the PMD talking about the authorities. Um, when we talk about the community getting involved as well, I think that's a tougher sell. Because there's no such thing as, uh, you know, if I can just be honest about community, because everybody is part of society, right? I mean, all individuals. Mm. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so making the public understand and breaking down the communication to the public as well is, is important. So, I, I look, the, the primary mover, if you just look from the government perspective, would definitely be the, the Prime Minister's department to bring everybody in. Uh, mm. And maybe uh, the Bar Council uh, also plays a very key role as well uh, mm. in making sure our legislations are always uh, relevant, uh, always kept in check. But the judiciary um, here should not be, be uh, you know, put aside because they play a key role and they have been very active, uh, I do believe, from what I've read and from what I understand, mm. in making sure KPIs are met, you know, and uh, Access to justice is is equally important as well, and and uh, not mm. delaying the amount of justice you know that, that you you are wanting to seek, you know it's also mm. something that we're looking into. So yes. that's the authority side. But then again, when we talk about the community side, I think it's it's our advocates, uh, you know, for community leaders to to come up, you know, and mm. maybe the politicians too would have a. If they really want to rally the people together, you know, about talking about making them understand on matters, you know, mm. that, that's very important because you must educate them from, of course, when you talk about uh, the PMD, the schools also can play a part, right? But yes. in, at the end of the day, it's, it's how community and community means all levels. It's not, it's not, it's not just the so-called T20 or the people always in the news, it's actually all levels need to understand that, okay, I know some basic rights, uh, I'm mm -hmm. part of the solution, and the authorities are there working with me, you know, and mm -hmm. that's breaking down uh, them from the resi uh, residence association, 
even societies that you're members of, you know, to be part of, you know, uh, the, the police watch, you know, and, and doing your part in that. So mm. if you ask me, is there one authority? Uh, the, the simple uh, strategy answer would definitely be, yeah, the Prime Minister's Department, but the harder part would be getting community to, to engage with the authorities. I think that is the real challenge on how we not only improve the rule of law ranking, but the overall perception of uh, the rule of law in, in Malaysia. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, you're right. I think the um, <clears throat> issue is more than just a ranking itself. It's just that we're using the ranking as a vehicle to know how well we are moving. Yeah. But the thing yeah. is, looking at the WJP and the WCY ranking, we are improving. In the last yeah. in the last few years, and even the number of positions we climb, in the WJP, we climb what four or five positions up. Yeah, so we, we have been improving. Yeah, so it is it is a sign that we are perhaps uh, moving in the right uh, track on the right track in the right in the yeah. right direction. Um, yeah. So, if there's one thing you would like this uh, online audience to take away, um, down to our level now, <laughs> you know, you talk <laughs> about the alignment of the general public to the uh, constitution, how we should know our hum our basic rights. Uh, and knowing that uh, you know the authorities are with us, if there's one thing you wanted to take away from this, what what would it be? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> this is really the force you to just going out to this one point. <laughs> I, I think uh, getting involved in your, I mean, because I, I'm talking from I'm, I'm a private citizen uh, here, right? Mm, if if yes. I were to to say is get involved in your local community. You know, uh, the more involved you are, then from there you can have a more collective voice to talk to, to the authorities together. Because, of course, you can do it yourself. Uh, you can do it as a single individual, but collectively, uh, when you're involved in your local community, it can be your local uh, bank surau, resident association, ke, you know, those types of groupings. But work uh, as a, as a community basis then your voice collectively is, is much stronger. Then when you mm. when you do uh, talk to the authorities, when you do give recommendations as a whole, I mean, not just on matters of uh, community security, but other measures uh, that other factors involved, mm. you talk in, in a community you know, basis. But I, I do have to qualify one point here. I mean, collectively now with social media, everybody becomes a professor overnight. Uh, mm. And that's the danger as well. I think before you want to voice your opinion or you want to, of course, you have the freedom to do so, but do it in a more, in a way that you've thought it through. Uh, do mm. it in a way that you know benefits the community in the long run. And, mm. you know, by you forwarding certain messages or ideas doesn't make you an expert overnight. So do the basic thing like uh, reading on, on your rights, reading on issues and having an open mind about things mm. possible. Um, helps you get a better understanding on an issue so that when you come together and you propose something to the authorities collectively, it is more accepted. So I think that's what I would ask, you know, come together collectively, but understand issues, analyze it, and then give your uh, recommendations. Because I'm, I'm talking purely from a private citizen on, on how I make possibly my voice heard, you know, and I think a collective voice is stronger than a individual voice, I feel. Yeah, I think I'm trying to say responsibly, uh, apart yeah. from collectively as well. <laughs> yes. yes well, thank, you, thank you for your opinion. Um, it was a very clear and very comprehensive coverage on um, the issues that we have here. Um, okay. Thank you. Once again, uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, thank you so much. Yeah, And thank you for contributing questions and concerns uh, to Inshari. Um, for audience who has uh, missed out on our past webinar presentation, you can still catch up with them. Uh, look up the YouTube channels. Uh, Malaysia, Malaysia Productivity Corporation has created a YouTube channel called uh, Productivity and Competitiveness Channel MPC. Uh, you'll find many eye-opening videos just like this. So thank you for your time. Um, we hope this uh, webinar is informative and useful to all of you. Um, with that, I, I again thank um, Inche Ari for your time and your thoughts. Uh, Thank share you. with all of us here. Yeah. Uh, until then, happy listening. Stay safe during this uh, CMCO. <laughs> um,
we will see you in a future competitiveness talks. Uh, thank you, Ari. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.